technology. We'd rather sort of lay out that, that, that foundation today so we all have an understanding. And frankly, so that those of you who are on the other side of the issue of someone who's up here showing something have had a preview of it and can help you prepare too. Because our, our, our goal is to you know, get the best information we can from both sides. So that's really what we're here uh, to do. Um, and with that, I think we'll just get started. So um, there will be no transcript, but we are videotaping it. And for those of you who have told us that we'd like you to copy of this before the hearings, we're going to do our utmost to get those to you. Um, we're a government agency, so don't expect too much out of our tech people. Uh, they're telling us we're not sure we can get it to you, you know, in 24-hour turnaround, but we're going to do our best to get it to you before next Friday's hearing. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, it's possible that during the course of the demonstrations, some of us from the copyright office may have questions, and those questions will be about what you're showing us again, not about the law and policy stuff. So we may ask them. It's also possible some of you out there who might be, for example, on the other side of an issue might have questions. We really don't want to turn this into a debate, um, but if someone does have a question, <coughs> What we ask, Rob, we have cards out there, you said? In the, yeah, in the back table. All right. Uh, cards, pass, pass. Write the question on a card and pass it up to us, and we'll make a judgment as to whether it makes sense for that question to be asked. Uh, we do have a schedule we want to keep, too. That's part of it. And again, we don't want to turn today into a debate. Today is show and tell day. Um, so, Dan, you can start. Great. Uh, thank you. So I'm Dan Auerbach. I'm a staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I'm here to give kind of a, a basic, gentle overview of jailbreaking. Um, so, here are our, uh, two classes of exemptions that uh, were proponents for the Electronic Computer Foundation that relate to jailbreaking. Um, I'll sort of read them both together. Uh, the first class is about uh, video game consoles, and the second class is about smartphones and tablets. But read together, it's computer programs that enable lawfully acquired video game consoles or smartphones and tablets in the case of class 5, to execute lawfully acquired software applications or circumventions undertaken for the purpose of enabling interoperability of such applications with computer programs on the gaming console. So that's really, uh, when I say jailbreaking, <laughs> that's what I'm referring to. So the goal of this presentation is, as I said, to give kind of a general, gentle uh, introduction to jailbreaking. So I want to talk about what locking down means, what jailbreaking means, uh, and what jailbreaking allows you to do. And from the perspective of an end user, one of us who wanted to go home and jailbreak our iPhone, what that process would look like. Um, perhaps many of you have already done that, but for, for those who haven't, this will be an introduction. Um, okay, so this is just the structure of the presentation. Uh, and so I should say that I'm going to hopefully have some time at the end for questions, but if, if something comes up and it's very unclear, feel free to, to, ask a, to interrupt me and ask a question during the presentation. Okay, what is jailbreaking? Uh, so I just read a long definition, but kind of when you boil it down, this is the definition that uh, I think makes the most sense in kind of a short way, which is getting administrative access to the device. When we talk about jailbreaking, really, this is what you should be thinking about. So, uh, jailbreaking lets you do a lot of different things. Uh, so it make, lets you uh, make use of device resources. So often, if a device is locked down, you won't be able to, to use all the resources. For instance, you won't be able to have unfettered network access, you won't be able to have access to the file system, things like this. Um, you can also play independently created games. Uh, you can use <coughs> approved apps. So, for instance, the Apple App Store lets you uh, or requires that apps be approved, and they have to go through the Apple approval process. Uh, with a jailbroken phone or tablet, you're able to, to use apps that are not approved by Apple. And finally, you can do things whose device the manufacturer can't anticipate. Um, I'm, I put that there just to highlight that jailbreaking isn't only about doing things that uh, the, the person controlling the platform doesn't want you to do. It's also about... Um, oh. Well, that's this important better? so that the video can get what you're ah, saying. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, I will definitely use the mic there. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I was saying that uh, doing things that you're, with your device that the manufacturer can't anticipate. So the idea is that it's not only about uh, trying to get around Apple's intentions. Sometimes what you're doing fits very well with Apple's intentions, but they just didn't anticipate a certain need. Um, so one example of this is there was a, a privacy leak with respect to the iPhone where the, if you got a text message, even before you unlocked the iPhone, the, the text of the text message would kind of scroll across the top. Uh, you know, it's a convenient feature, but also a privacy problem because anyone walking by could see the contents of your text message, even if they didn't unlock the phone. Um, so uh, with a, a jailbroken phone, this was fixed. There was a, a mode that stopped it from happening. And uh, Apple eventually followed suit and offered that same functionality. OK, so just to put it in context a bit, uh, devices are getting more powerful and multifaceted, and this is why jailbreaking is more important. Um, just as an example, the PlayStation has, in addition to being able to play games, it's a Blu-ray player, it has a fully featured browser, you can <coughs> subscription to a bunch of video services, it, you can just plug and play with a US keyboard, USB keyboard and mouth, it has a very powerful graphics processing unit. Um, and that chart at the bottom, you can't really read it, so I'll, I'll read it. Uh, but it's basically a, a study of how people use gaming consoles. Uh, and let's see, actually, I'm not, I can't read it either right now. <laughs> um, oops. Just a moment. Yeah, that is very small. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, let me try to stand over here. Sorry, I'll, I'll uh, raise my voice so that you can hear me. So it's 22% of uh, uses are for, are for online gaming, 19% is for watching uh, uh, DVDs and Blu-ray. So this study was done in the UK, uh, and that'll come up in a second. 12% is for browsing the internet, 9% is for watching BBC programs. Programs is, of course, spelled with an extra M and E on the end. <laughs> Uh, 4% is for watching live TV, 22% is for watching video content, and I think that's 11% is for watching IPTV. I, I didn't make sure all those added up, but uh, it's a bit hard to, to read. Okay, so that's just kind of a backdrop of what we're talking about and why it's important. So now I want to uh, shift gears and sort of talk about the basic technology behind locking something down and what jailbreaking really is. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a picture of the main, uh, the, the following slides will be a picture of the main uh, kind of goals of jailbreaking. So this, in the olden days, you just had a device and it ran software. Of course that software would have to be compatible with the device, but pretty much there were no additional checks beyond that. And I should say that this is still more or less the status quo for computers right now, personal computers, laptops and uh, <coughs> desktops still kind of operate in this model. So now let's talk about uh, what locking down means. So uh, the foundation of how to lock something down is based on uh, something called public key cryptography, which was a concept invented in the 70s uh, that has had enormous implications for our society, it underlies our e-commerce, and it's an incredibly interesting subject. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to, to beyond the scope of this presentation to talk in too much detail about it, which is sad for me because I'm a math guy and I really think it's cool. But uh, I'll just give a very brief overview of uh, the, the basic mechanism that underlies locking things down. So it's called a digital signature. And the way it works is there's two keys, a private key and a public key. And these two keys are mathematically linked such that you can encrypt something with a private key and it can be decrypted with a public key. So you want to distribute that public key widely. You want everyone to have it. And you just want to keep your private key private. <coughs> and what this allows you to do is to digitally sign, uh, have a hashing algorithm where you create a little message digest from whatever the original document was. And then you encrypt it with a private key. And doing so uh, allows anyone with the corresponding public key to verify, ah, this, this document has been signed by the party that has that private key. And so in the context of, uh, of locking down a device, uh, the basic idea <coughs> is that software gets signed 
by either a manufacturer or platform owner. So you can imagine uh, that the software is an Apple app, <coughs> excuse me, an App Store app from Apple, and the device is an iPhone. And so the device will only oh, it has the public key corresponding to uh, Apple's private key, and so it'll only run software that uh, has Apple's signature on it. And if, it tr if you try to run other software, it'll say, wait a second, I don't see this, the signature, and I only have this one public key corresponding to Apple, so I can't run the software. But So this is kind of the basic idea, but we're not really locked down yet, because as long as you control the device, you could, for instance, add another key. So suppose you say, well, I trust uh, software from Microsoft as well. So that blue key corresponds to things that are signed by Microsoft. So I'm going to add Microsoft's public key to my little key store on my device. And now I'll be able to run software from Apple or from Microsoft. Um, so locking down is this next step, where basically the, the platform owner or the manufacturer doesn't want you to be able to mess with the keys in that way. They want to kind of create a, a jail, and I use air quotes because there is kind of a technical term jail that's distinct from this um, that I'm not, I'm, I'm not using. I'm just talking about it in kind of a general context. The idea is that the mechanism that allows you to, to figure out which software to run and the keys that, uh, that are used to verify that software they don't want you to have control over that. So this is kind of the, the really fundamental idea behind locking something down. It's taking away control <coughs> over that part of the device. And jailbreaking, simply put, is just getting back to the situation. So I want to emphasize that the jail in this case can be extraordinarily complex. Um, it itself can involve uh, private keys and public keys. Uh, and this, this story kind of has a lot of twists and turns, but fundamentally, this is what it's about. It's about stopping you from controlling the part of the device where you can decide what software to run. And so this is relevant in different contexts, the story I've told. So for instance, a bootloader is the piece of code, a small piece of code that runs when you start up a device, and it selects which uh, operating system to run. So in this case, you could have a signed operating system, and your bootloader would say, I'm only going to load you know, this sort of operating system. I'm only going to load uh, Windows. Um, and if, if you jailbreak, that allows you to, to say, okay, well, I, now I can load Linux as well. Um, this, so the same story works in the context of an iPhone verifying apps or a, a console verifying games. Uh, so that gives kind of a, a little general overview of jailbreaking and at the core what locking down things mean. Uh, now I wanted to turn to jailbreaking for the iPhone. Um, so I have an iPhone here. It's already jailbroken. Uh, I, the, the actual process of jailbreaking is quick enough that I might have been able to do it live at this demo. Uh, however, loading the software that I wanted to demonstrate afterwards is takes time. So instead, I just pre-jailbroke it. Ideally, I'd have two phones and I'd jailbreak one and the other one would be ready. But uh, we're a nonprofit at EFF and we do the best we can with our limited resources. Okay. Um, so, uh, the two points I want to cover for jailbreaking the iPhone are what does it look like from an end user? How do you jailbreak your iPhone? And also, what does it allow you to do? So, uh, there are lots of different uh, hardware and software versions. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. But suffice it to say that this just shows that you know, a new firmware version will come out, or a new phone will come out, and then on the order of a couple months, there'll be a, a, a jailbreak. Or it'll either be a new jailbreak or a kind of a derivative of an old jailbreak that still works. Um, OK, so how to jailbreak from a user perspective? Well, for old versions of iOS, it turns out it was incredibly simple. All you had to do was take your phone, open the Safari browser, go to jailbreakme.com, and that little thing on the right would appear, and then you just slide, and your phone, it, it takes some time, maybe five minutes, and then your phone is jailbroken. So it's really that easy um, to, do, to do this. <coughs> so later versions of iOS, uh, so this demo device is running iOS 5.0.1. Uh, I use an exploit called Red Snow to jailbreak this device. 
And it was also quite easy. Not quite as easy as just visiting a website, but essentially uh, you just ha have a USB cable, you attach it to your computer, you download software on your computer, and you run it, and it will jailbreak your phone. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty easy process. The total time is five minutes. Maybe 15 minutes of nervous Googling to make sure that you're uh, not going to break your device. But after that, the actual jailbreak is just five minutes or so. Okay, so once you've jailbroken, uh, one of the things I want to highlight is there's this extremely pervasive uh, Cydia alternative app store. It's an open source alternative to the Apple app store. And it has 4.5 million weekly users, $10 million in annual revenue. Uh, it forbids pirated apps. Um, it also forbids things like adult content. Uh, and also I just want to highlight that it's not just free stuff. Some, some apps sell for money in Cydia. Tethering is, is an example of that. <coughs> and I will show that in just a second. So I'm going to now display um, my phone's my phone on this computer screen using uh, this protocol called VNC, and or this uh, service called VNC, and it looks like it's already working. Um, and it's important to note that I could only do this. I can only do this because uh, this phone is jailbroken. So it allowed me to download the VNC <coughs> software. If, if it weren't for a jailbroken phone, I wouldn't be able to do this in this demo. So uh, you might notice that the theme has changed. Uh, this is one of the kind of cool things you can do with a jailbroken iPhone. Uh, and to do that, you just open this Winterboard application. And you can change themes here. I'm not going to do it now because it would require kind of restarting part of the phone, but that's the basic idea. Um, let's see. So now I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of an overview of what Cydia looks like. So again, this is the alternative app store. Um, so there's a ton of products here. I'll just. Uh, go to MyY, so you know there are an enormous amount of applications available through this. So this costs $20 and allows you to tether your phone. Uh, for those of you who don't know, tethering means, uh, several of us are doing it right now, I believe, uh, tethering means using your 3G connection on your phone as a Wi-Fi access point. So this is enormously convenient when you're on your laptop and there's no Wi-Fi available and you have your phone, you can just turn it to an access point and then use the internet with your computer. Um, turns out carriers don't like this. They don't want you to be able to use their data plans this way. Uh, so as a result, you cannot do this without a jailbroken phone. But with a jailbroken iPhone, uh, there's a bunch of different apps that let you do this. This one costs 20 bucks um, and is available through Cydia. OK, so I'm going to move on from this part of the demo. So in addition to kind of doing cool stuff, having games and access to apps that uh, you wouldn't otherwise, there's also very important things that you can do by jailbreaking your phone. Uh, so uh, VPNs, uh, virtual private networks, are an important mechanism for security. Uh, if you are a dissident in Iran, for instance, and are being monitored by your government, you want a very secure VPN in order to be able to, to use your phone uh, and know that your communications aren't being spied on. So uh, this uh, this situation actually just came up recently with a coworker of ours, our wonderful web developer, Micah. Uh, he wanted to use a, a VPN service. <coughs> this is a screenshot from their website. They compared the two uh, clients they support, OpenVPN or PPTP. And I'll just read the top line about security. They say, they're comparing these two. They say, OpenVPN creates a very secure connection. PPTP, although commonly used, PPTP provides little security against a targeted attack. So OpenVPN is good, PPTP is bad. Um, this is the sort of thing that can really mean life and death if you are under surveillance. Um, unfortunately, without a jailbroken iPhone, PPTP is the only option for you. 
So in order to improve your security in a meaningful way, you have to jailbreak your iPhone. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to jailbreaking to the Wii. I think I just have a few minutes left, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, so the, there's kind of two big appeals to jailbreaking the Wii. There's the homebrew channel, so there's a large community of people who, uh, who uh, create independent games, and uh, the homebrew channel allows, them, allows you to play those, and I'll show that in just a second. And also you can get Linux on the Wii. You can pretty much get Linux anywhere. And let me just turn it on and... So this is the only screen that will be showing the Wii's output. This is the fun part of the presentation. Now the boring part's over. Um, so this is the Homebrew channel. Uh, as you can see, it fits very nicely with the aesthetics of the Wii. And um, so here are some games that I've downloaded. Maybe this one will be memorable to some people. <laughs> So, here we go. <laughs> Behold technology and all of <laughs> Oh, I just lost that point. Okay. Um, let's take this. Sorry, it doesn't want me to feel like this. I guess we're stuck playing Pong. Um, <laughs> Try turning it off and turning it back on again? Yeah, I can do that. Um, I was hoping I would, I'd be able to avoid that. But I'm certain. Anyway, all right, I'll just turn it back on. Uh, yeah, and just one final thing I wanted to show. Uh, and I hope this works. Um, is the, the homebrew browser. So this just gives a sense of... <coughs> uh, how many games are available and... Oh, I, so while I'm doing this, I should say that the actual process of jailbreaking the Wii, very similar to the iPhone, is very easy. It requires you, you get an SC card, you put it in your computer, you download some software, then you stick it here in the Wii, and then uh, you have to kind of navigate to this little letter bomb thing, and you, you click on it, and you're jailbroken. So this just gives kind of a sense of how many games and uh, emulators and stuff like that are on this. Um, so, here are all the games, there's also kind of demos, emulators, media, utilities, so you can kind of download any of these and play them. Uh, you can also do stuff as a developer that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Uh, I have something where you can kind of dump the memory, for instance. So that just gives kind of a, a basic overview of uh, what jailbreaking looks like for the Wii and uh, the iPhone, and that concludes my presentation. So. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. <coughs> like no questions? All right, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so the goal of the presentation is to uh, demonstrate the uh, capabilities that jailbreaking provides for developers. Um, so basically, as Dan touched on, two things that jailbreaking can give you is uh, unlocking the bootloader, which allows you to install a uh, custom ROM or a custom kernel on the device, which can give you extra uh, capabilities, or uh, attaining root access on the device. Um, 
So for an operating system like Android, which is based on Unix or Linux, um, it has the concept of user uh, user permissions, and uh, in classic Unix form, uh, the root user is the super user that has no uh, restrictions on their on their permissions. So getting root access allows you to do anything you want. So, first thing I'm going to demonstrate is uh, Mozilla has created a. Uh, we already we already had automated testing for all of our platforms, uh, all of our tier one platforms. So that's Linux, Mac, and Windows. So in order for Android to become a tier one platform at Mozilla, we needed to have the automated testing framework work on Android. In order to get that fully operational, we needed root access on these devices to uh, get around all of the uh, permission issues. So not only do we run these automated tests on every check-in into uh, our code repositories, but developers can also run them locally on a tablet like this. So here I'll show what we call Moki tests. Um, and these basically test browser functionality for I think basically test browser functionality for rendering content on the web. And as you'll see, this test suite loads various uh, pages in an iframe um, and compares them against reference images. So it will load something that's supposed to be rendered as a green square and checks that it actually is a green square by screenshotting it. A second to uh, load the tests on the device and bring the browser. So you see Firefox for Android. See the uh, this this little iframe here is loading the various tests, which are part of the W3C uh, test suite. This allows different browsers to interoperate, and things on the web be rendered the same in Firefox or Android or, or uh, Safari or Internet Explorer. And it will continue to run these um, on the console here. It's giving me the results um, when we run these in automation. The results get uh, printed out and posted on a website so that you can see uh, how your <laughs> patch did. to watch the whole thing run. Um, so this is an example of the power that having root access gives us. Next I'm going to show a tool called Valgrind. Um, this is a very powerful tool uh, that developers can use on Linux. And being that Android is based on Linux, we're able to uh, port it. So um, I have set a property on the device to launch with Dalgrind when I launch. And I will launch the browser via the command line. Like so. Um, and one thing to note is that Dalgrind is very, <coughs> slows things down a lot. Um, it, it installs a lot of books. So it will take a moment for the browser to come up, but on the console, I will show you what the developer sees. Yes. 
Um, so you can see this output um, from Valgrind waiting for the browser to come up, um, just, just through the startup process. Um, each one of these lines is an error that Valgrind, this, this particular tool within Valgrind, the Valgrind suite called Memcheck, found while the browser is running. Um, so far, for us, was this pretty good. Um, all the errors it's found has been with the operating system. Um, not, nothing with, with uh, Mozilla's code yet. And it does take a couple minutes for it to come fully. Again, um, more errors that it's finding, or potential errors, I should say. Um, these could be completely harmless. harmless. Um, however, they warrant investigation by a developer. Uh, and you see the browser is now up. You see the output that's come through the startup process, and you can see the browser is up and running. Um, because Valgrind slows things down so terribly, I will not go through too many, too, too much more of this. In fact, just bringing up the menu to put it. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. yeah I'm going to turn off this device, Valgrind, and show a more classic debugging tool. Again, um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask them. I know a lot of this is actually fairly technical. So again, from the console, I'm going to launch uh, Firefox with the debugger attached this time. Without Valgrind, you see it does actually come up a lot faster. Um, switching back over to the console, uh, you can see this is the debugger. It is loading in the libraries from the device, um, so we can get all the symbols, so that when something wrong uh, goes wrong, it can tell you what went wrong. Um, this uh, Relic module is large, so that will take, again, a few moments. Okay, um, so it's come up. I'm just going to tell it to continue to run. And I, um, in order to demonstrate this, put a bug in here intentionally. That makes it a feature. <laughs> Note that GDB does slow it down just a whole lot less so than uh, in the <coughs> And in order to, uh, so the bug I put in here is when, um, when we go to show the file picker, um, there's a null pointer. Um, so, my little test site asks the browser to show a, a file picker to pick a file. Uh, you might see this on 
like TwitPic or something. Although you won't now because they won't let you upload a file from a phone anymore. Because they want you to use their app. Right, you can see, um, so I got that uh, psych fault. Um, the debugger comes up, I can get a backtrace on it. Um, and see, see where, how we got to this point in the program. Uh, it's running a lot slower than it should. So one interesting thing about ARM versus x86 um, on the technical side is you don't have uh, stack pointers, in, um, which means that in order for the debugger to recreate this stack, it needs to actually read the libraries to figure out how, um, how much stack each function allocated to uh, walk, walk its way back on the stack. Um, so I'll just show you that you can then go and show you the code where this was uh, Called from, and you can walk the stack by looking at the different frames here. You can see where I put m equals null, and therefore we got a null pointer as soon as I check the user. show is um, Boot to Gecko, which um, has been a fair amount of buzz about. So this is a off-the-shelf uh, Galaxy S2 that because we had um, an unlocked bootloader, we were able to install our own operating system. In fact, we weren't just able to install our own operating system, we were able to create our own operating system. Um, the interesting thing about this is, um, for various reasons, um, which I don't pretend to speculate on, uh, carriers don't uh, particularly like jailbreaking. However, um, with Boot to Gecko, carriers are lining up to go and sell this operating system, which was made possible by jailbreaking. So, um, you can see we've. The point of Boot to Gecko is it's a very small Linux kernel that runs the entire shell as Firefox. Um, each one of the apps. So this is actually the Firefox brother browser running within Boot to Gecko. So Firefox running in Firefox, which is very meta. Um, apparently the Wi-Fi is not working very well. So I'll stick to things that don't require Wi-Fi, such as a, uh, a phone dialer. Um, the Boot to Gecko operating system provides um, all these device APIs such that you can actually make a call through the browser. So this is a, a website that is local to the device that can dial a number and make the call. And uh, that's about it I have to demonstrate. Are there any questions? Um, can you explain, uh, if, if you didn't have root access to install the debugging tools, um, how that would hinder your ability to develop applications for these vendors? That's a good question. repeat the question so that people want Watching the, yep. uh, the question was, uh, if we didn't have root access on these devices, how would that hinder our ability to develop software? Um, is that? Um, so there are things you can do without root access. Um, for instance, from Android 2.2 and above, you can um, mark an application as debuggable, and it will allow you, with a command line, um, to run with the permissions of that application, which allows you to actually detach GDB to a debuggable application. Um, however, that means that would be a security flaw for our production um, builds that we would not want to give our, our users. So in order to debug uh, the production builds that we have, we need to have root access on those devices. In addition to that, um, there was a bug in the implementation of, uh, it's called run as, is the, uh, um, the feature in Android. There's a bug in that implement implementation. Um, they basically said that there can be no more than, I think it was 496 bytes 
in this uh, file that listed out all of the all of the applications that can be debugged. Um, so for um, many phones that come with a lot of pre-installed software, um, when you when you get the phone, there's maybe one two spots left for debuggable applications, and after that, you're done. So um, even for a private developer that wants to develop software, if you want to do it, um, I, I, I had a Motorola Atrix that would not allow me to uh, use run as because it was out of space. So um, that bug has been fixed in, in ICS, but still, you cannot run GDB <coughs> on um, you cannot run GDB on production builds of Firefox um, because of that limitation. For Valgrind, it would not be possible at all. Um, for Valgrind, we need a custom kernel that um, allows. Uh, loading of certain probes um, to get the information it uses uh, to, to monitor the memory. In addition, um, for most hardware, um, the amount of uh, symbols that Valgrind loads um, is more than the memory on the device. So you need to um, create a, a kernel that um, has swap enabled, and swap allows you to um, write up to disk, have virtual, virtual memory, basically. Um, and uh, it, Build a kernel that allows swap and enable swap on that device in order for Valgrind to be able to run. Um, let's see what I'll say. And I also showed the um, the automated testing. Um, we wouldn't be able to do the automated testing um, for uh, an unrooted device. There are some tests. So our, our tools in general require root. Um, if we were in a world that did not have root, we could write more limited tools that you know only did the things that we could do without root. Um, but we would not be able to run the full suite of tests, and um, I don't think Mozilla would ever consider Android to be a tier one platform if we weren't able to run those tests. Any other questions? And of course, we wouldn't be able to install, we wouldn't have been able to create a boot gecko if we could not have uh, a mock Any other Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brett Lykoop. I'm from New Yorkers for Fair Use. And uh, I'm here today to talk about ownership of computing devices, really. Uh, this device that you see in front of you, it's a, uh, an Android device made by Samsung. Uh, I gave Sprint a couple hundred dollars for it a couple years ago. But I don't actually own the device. That might be something that people think is odd, but I don't own the device. Sprint still owns the device, because unlike the presenters that gave the excellent presentations before me, I have not jailbroken this phone. And I'm a very technical person, been in the technical field for 30 years, it's well within my capabilities to do, but I decided, you know what, I want to see what everybody has to put up with. That doesn't actually own their computing device. So, among the things that you have to put up with if you're in this category of users is your carrier shoving software down to your phone that you don't want. Even if you turn off updates, which I have done on this phone. I'm just gonna show you one of the applications that got onto the phone by the carrier shoving, shoving it down in the, the dead of night it's this thing called Wear that's right here. Now, I have no idea what this thing does. I don't want it. And the interesting thing is that if you go to the tool, it allows you to manage the applications by default on an Android device. You can't find it to remove it. In checking with friends of mine who have had the same device and have indeed jailbroken it, they're like, well, yeah, that's the only way I could get rid of that thing. And fortunately, most carriers do some sort of checksum on your operating system and won't shove down junk to a jailbroken phone. And even if they do, you're well within your capabilities to remove it. But you can see this list is in alphabetical order and where is not showing up. <clears throat> so obviously I don't own my phone because I can't control it. Now we'll give another quick demonstration of this. I'm just going to open up 
a terminal program. This gives me a local Linux shell on this Android device. <clears throat> and you can see we've got an attempt here to remove a file, this, this uh, init goldfish.rc is not something that I actually installed on the phone. It appeared much like that where application appeared uh, after my carrier Sprint decided to shove updates at me. So I tried to remove it, and you see it says failed, permission denied. Well, why did that fail? If you look at the permissions there, those of you that are Unix literate will recognize that only the root user has the ability to uh, write that file, which means only the root user has the ability to remove it. Uh, there are tons of files in the Android operating system that get marked such that the ordinary user cannot remove it. If it's illegal for the ordinary user to gain control at the lowest level of their computer, then they don't actually own their computer. And let's not kid ourselves. These small devices are computers. This device has more computing power than the computers that used to run the IRS 20 years ago. Uh, the fact that we even have to be here and talk about this, uh, talk about what I can do with private property that I have bought, or at least that I thought I bought, and we have to be begging for permission from the government to make full use of our property is ludicrous. Um, so these are, are some of the harms of the DMCA when it comes to computing devices. If people don't have control of their computing devices, uh, they, they don't really own them, and they can't do with them what they want. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to my associate, Jay Salzberger. Oh, right, thank you. <laughs> I don't hide. My name is Jake Salzberger. I'm going to repeat what the other people here have said, perhaps in a louder and more annoying tone <coughs> voice. Um, let's see, I don't have any demonstration. I'll tell you a story. Yesterday I bought a used computer. It's one of the more recent Lenovo's. I, I, guy underpriced it, there must be something wrong with it, but it looked okay in Manhattan yesterday. It's 220 bucks. I looked at it running Windows, made some joke about who are you do running Windows. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Um, and then, you know, I bought it. it. Walks out of the little restaurant where we've met. And I pull out of my pocket a USB um, a USB storage device, and I stuck it in. It's got a bootable operating system on here. And it turns out that, um, that when you start up um, the, the, these laptops, it, it has an order. It, the, uh, the first part, startup uh, hardware, has an order. It looks around for an operating system in the order of the hard drive, um, I think the network. And then the third thing it looked for was a USB hard drive, such as this thing when it's plugged in. And I went, and there's some little thing, you click on it and you move it around usually, and you can then boot from the USB hard drive. And it said, in the BIOS screen, to use the technical term, it said, you're not allowed because you're not the administrator of this machine to change the order of boot. Now, I called the fellow who just sold it to me, this is not 15 minutes after he left the restaurant, he said, oh yeah, let me tell you the BIOS password, I heard it correctly, I put it in, and I booted up my operating system on my hardware that I owned, my operating system of choice. I'm just going to repeat what Brett and the other people have said. This is the central issue. This is not a copyright issue. And literally millions of Americans, and there are over a million Americans who understand this, this is an issue our right to own a computer. If the Register of Copyrights and the people from the Commerce Department and the Librarian of Commerce don't give us 
formal, don't give us back our formal legal right to own a computer, then this country, the people of this country, will lose the right to have a computer that is absolutely under their control. This is the issue. Now, people have discussed root in the, in the newspapers. There's Apple for mentioning. Apple's problems with Apple are often phrased as follows. You know, you have an iPhone and an iPad, and there's a walled garden. Apple is your sysadmin, a very bad sysadmin, I might add, in some ways. Those of you who remember the bastard operator from hell, this is a hell of a lot worse. That guy <coughs> didn't actually stop magazines and newspapers from letting you see their websites until they paid the sysadmin 30% right off the top. I'm not interested in the antitrust. I think, as a matter of fact, the antitrust, this is the personal opinion, um, against Apple for this would simply reinforce by implicit acceptance the situation which is that Apple owns, when you walk out of the store, as has been said by every single proceeding person here speaking today, you don't own that device. Are we as a country, do we want to get rid of the right to own a computer? If there's not an exemption for total control of the computer that you supposedly bought, that will be the situation because at the moment they can make it difficult for you to get control of the device. But some devices are palladiated. The, the Apple is, um, is not. They don't. Apple hasn't made a serious attempt to keep people out as people were saying. Um, other people have. Sony has taken people to court because they've gotten control of a piece of hardware that they bought. Now let me speak to the objections of the copyright involvulators. Yeah. I, I, what it sounds like I'm hearing is what you're supposed to be telling us on May 31st, because this is supposed to be a tech demo. Okay. This is not supposed to be. Well, let me let me let me give you a tech demo then. Okay. Let me give you a tech demo. Um. You're right. Uh, and but it's very important to understand the technical meaning of the word root. So, let me. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. So I'll return to the issue of diction. And that's as technical as you want. Maybe more. I thought, or, <laughs> sorry. Um, people say, I, I, I really would like to have had longer to speak, and I would have said this would be purely uh, a lexicographic talk, talk of lexicography. When, when the newspapers say walled garden, they don't say, go ahead, sir. Can you actually use the microphone? So I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry. Uh, when, when, when the newspapers use the word walled garden, can, can the stuff we see? How does one know? You know how does one, can one see the discussed anything? Um, my, ge my geometry is not good here. Um, okay, so look, that's Windows. We have Windows here. And, no, it's, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm unprepared. Um, that's okay. The, the point is you can see that it's probably Windows. I probably don't have a little painting made by a friend of mine that looks like the Windows startup screen. It's actually Windows. I don't run Windows. Um, I don't like it in the ordinary sense. Of I never use such a ridiculous thing. But in addition, of course, I won't agree to run something where it's against the law for me to look at the code and tell other people about it. Okay, so 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 I checked it out and then and then I turned it off. Um, and and then I thought to put in this little thing, and we're now going to come to the technical part here. Okay. Okay, so it's shutting down now. And I I, I want to convey to you just what exactly is at stake at the technical level. That means understanding the word root. Okay, now let me see if I can do this. I'm going to hold this thing down here. And I'm going to press the sync thing. I press one of the F, F12. Okay, let me hit F12. Okay. Set up. Let me enter set up here, and it's asking me actually for a um, for, for a password. I'm going to put in the password here. Okay, and 
and um, I guess startup is the thing. Boot. Oh, okay. It's already set up. But it was interesting. I showed you that. Um, let's get this little thing in here. And um, let's see. F. F10 save and exit. I presume to do it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now at this point, we're about to run a different operating system. Let me tell you. We seem to have lost the video, Jay. You've uh, got to stay over by the microphone over okay, the recording to get you. Okay, how could. Well, you know what? It probably isn't. isn't we'll, we'll try going to the thing. Yeah, maybe if you could just put it in there. That's, can, you see, can you see it? Can't see it. Can't see anything. Somehow arrange it so that here's. Oh, uh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a very important point. That's actually my main point. You're being extra careful because it's not yours. You're the difference between leasing a department and owning your house, I think we all understand. The newspapers don't report the difference between owning a Lenovo that I own. I own this thing. And, and having an iPad, which you do not own in the ordinary sense. And no lawyers will object to the concept of property is complex. There are 18 different kinds. I agree with them. I'm involved with those it. complexities. Okay. So don't, don't move the computer. I <laughs> no, I shouldn't be able to move better. It's supposed to be a job. <coughs> it's always doing something. Now, if the DMCA anti-circumvention exemption four request is um, it will not be possible to do what's happening right now. Because there won't be any password in the BIOS except one that's owned by Microsoft. And they will control in the way before the decision, I've forgotten what the name of the book was, The Outcast, which John Mitchell told me about just recently. I have bought a few books at used bookstores. I bought a few books at used bookstores for about 1900. And a few of them have, have licensed things on them, which the Supreme Court overturned, which say that you can't resell the thing for less than this amount of money. And this was fought. It's part of the reason we have absolutely free libraries with regard to use of the books. Of course, they're not free to buy the books, the staff, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's a fight, by the way, which was lost in, in most of Europe, I think. I think in England, uh, the books and the a few public libraries that are like the Americans, um, they actually have to pay. They uh, rent them, they pay a whatever, I don't know the legal term, they pay a certain amount every time a book is taken out. Um, so the, um, the, uh, the issue of anti-circumvention is this, and people have been saying root control, and root control just means at this point, sometimes the discussion runs off into Turing machines, which are only defined at infinity. So we won't worry about Turing machines. But we will worry about the ordinary use of an ordinary computer, such as was the only kind of computer you could buy 10 years ago, a laptop or a home computing device. At that period, um, it may have been irrelevant in one sense that people had root on it or not, because they never ever descended to that level. Sometimes they did, they had to reinstall Windows or one of the Apple OS's. And of course the people who were running the free Unices, uh, if they wanted root, they had root on a device that they owned. Um, so, so, so now the claim is that in order to prevent violation of copyrights, massive, incredible violation of copyrights um, using home computers and the internet, that we should give up the right to own a computer. Well, I think the other side may be right about some things. Some businesses may go out of business because people violate copyrights. Uh, most people in the free software movement are not for violation of copyright. As a matter of fact, we have crafted a relatively subtle and so far upheld in court copyright licenses upon which part of our legal protection um, depends. 
but they may be right. So I think America has to ask itself with regard to um, the anti-circumvention um, clauses and the exemptions, do we wish to give up the right to own a personal computer so that a few, perhaps large, perhaps rich, perhaps influential private companies can, they think, continue to have the profits that they do? I say vote the other way. I say vote to keep the right to own a computer. Um, I don't know what this is. This is some operating system. I, 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 I'm not going to, what can I show you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to do anything. I was going to wipe out the Windows thing, which is not particularly interesting to me. But we could certainly wipe it out. Um, sure, let me, let, me, let me wipe it out. something called CF disk. Yeah, you can't move the computer, Jay. Or ah, you're right, of course, of course. I'm an idiot. Right, right. Right. But you knew that already. I've been talking. Um, so let me try CF disk. I don't know what they call it. Dev, SDA, maybe. There's CF disk. I'm going to um, I'm going to delete this. Okay, I'm going to write it now. Yes. Okay. Um, we're, we're done. Probably I've destroyed the Windows operating system. It's not clear because they do tricks of these things. It's not important. <clears throat> um, if, 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 if I sat down here half an hour, it's not something I do every day. I'll not only, after half an hour, well, uh, what I actually would do would be pull out a CD, install a different operating system. It takes nowadays, it takes me a couple of hours to do it because the standard Debian is missing about 20 programs and I have to pull them off the net, install them, and check them out to see that they're configured the way I like. But, but that's it. I bought a used computer. There won't be any buying of used computers in the way that I bought one. I'm running out of time. What time is it? What time is it 11 o'clock, sir? Um, it's a little after 11. Okay. I, I don't know what to say. Um, anybody have, I'd love to hear questions. My main complaint is against the newspapers that don't report. They use the word walled garden. I probably said this word. I live in a walled garden. I run Debbie. They've got 30,000 packages. Almost all of the software on any of my machines including work machines that I don't own. Um, they're, they're, they're Debian packages. I press a little button and they're pulled off. It's like the App Store. Some people call it the App Store. And, and years ago when there was no App Store, we used to tell people, my God, what do you have to go through to install things? We just press a button and it installs it. Okay, so they're catching up in that respect. Okay, my main point is this. America is undergoing a transition and if we don't stop it, it'll be less the America that I grew up in and love. Thanks. Thank you. Quite the order that uh, was listed on the agenda. We're going to start with the opponents, uh, people who are here appearing on behalf of opponents of glasses, if I read this right, 7, 8, and 10. Um, and Bruce Turnbull will be starting off, and he'll introduce the folks who will be following him on that side. Then we'll be followed by that. Uh, after that, by Jim Morissette. And I don't know, Jack, are you going to be speaking too? Not unless called on. <laughs> Not unless Jim's screwed it up. Okay. Uh, they'll follow afterwards. Okay. Yes, I'm uh, Bruce Turnbull. I'm counsel to the ACS uh, LA group and to the DVD Copy Control Association. And I'm just going to briefly introduce what we're going to be demonstrating this afternoon. Uh, first, uh, Timothy Short, who's a teacher at the Poolsville High School in Montgomery County, who's appearing on behalf of us, not on behalf of the public schools or for his high school. Um, we'll be demonstrating uh, screen capture software using a program uh, that is available for purchase for $39.95. Uh, second, uh, David Taylor, my co-counsel, uh, will be demonstrating a video recording using a smartphone and video editing software, uh, which is available for $49. Um, 
that the software is. Uh, third, um, Don Lake, from, uh, who's uh, with IBM and is co-manager of the AACS uh, LA organization, will be demonstrating the AACS technology uh, managed copy, which will be introduced uh, later, later in the year. Uh, finally, although not under our umbrella, but, but on the same uh, perspective, uh, Mitch Singer uh, from Sony Pictures will be uh, doing a presentation on a variety of video available, what, what video is available in, in uh, uh, the marketplace today, uh, concluding with uh, ultraviolet. Uh, so that's, that's what we have uh, planned for a presentation. I'll just let Tim go ahead. Um, as Mr. Trimble said, uh, my name is Tim Short. I'm a, a high school teacher in Montgomery County, just up north. Um, a little bit out, out of my element here, so I'm kind of imagining you all as 15 or 16 year old sophomores in high school, and that's kind of keeping me a little bit more calm. Um, so I'm here to demonstrate a screen capture uh, software today. Um, four main objection, objectives that I have. Uh, number one, I'm just going to show you about a minute of a, of a DVD. Uh, played on my computer here, just so you can kind of see the DVD quality uh, of it played. Uh, once I do that, I'm going to demonstrate how easy it is to use a screen capture software to make a clip version saved on my computer uh, of the same clip. Um, third, to uh, replay uh, that clip that we just made, so you can kind of see the quality and, and compare it for your own selves um, compared to the DVD. Uh, and then finally, I have just um, to show you uh, just a couple quick, we probably won't go through the, uh, the um, actual clips, but clips that I've actually used or taken for my classroom and how I might apply those and why clips are a little bit more important than having necessarily uh, the DVD. Okay, so um, what we currently have um, on the screen right now is um, the DVD is in my computer of Gattaca. Uh, some of you might be aware, um, both the DVDs that I have are kind of from the school library. Um, it's a scene that my wife often shows, she's a biology teacher also in high school, um, and it's all about uh, what's called eugenics, so you know, basically choosing the egg that you are going to use to, uh, to uh, have offspring. So I'm just going to play that, like I said, for maybe about a minute, just so you can kind of see the DVD quality. of their day, they were determined that their next child would be brought into the world in what has become a natural way. Your extracted eggs have been fertilized with Antonio's sperm. After screening, they left, as you see, with two healthy boys and two very healthy girls. Naturally, no critical predispositions to any major inheritable diseases. All that remains is to select the most compatible candidate. First, we may as well decide on gender. Have you given it any thought? Uh, we would want Vincent to have a brother, you know, um, to play with. Of course you would. Hello, Vincent. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, so you, you get the sense of the quality of the DVD, um, you know, without playing the entire scene. Uh, what I'm going to show now is how uh, this is uh, what's the replay video capture. Um, and what it's going to do is uh, imagine a clear cellophane uh, kind of wrapper that goes onto uh, the video that's being played, but it's actually recording what's in the box that you can define. Um, so as you notice, as I start the video and pr pl uh, press get video, I've taken the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial just wanted to stop so you can see. Um, as I say, um, when I press get video, it, it opens up that kind of cellophane wrapper uh, to, um, to the video. I could then size it however I would want to. I'm just gonna size it down just so it's capturing exactly what I want. Now, in addition to that, if let's say I had a clip that I only wanted to focus on one individual in the scene, I could potentially also do that as a teacher as well. So that we cut out kind of all the extra stuff. Just gives me a little bit extra capability in that regard. Okay, so now that I've kind of defined my area, I'm gonna go ahead and play the video, press record, and it's actually going to um, be making a copy of, of the clip that I've defined. Conditions, uh, premature baldness, myopia, alcoholism, and addictive susceptibility, 
a state of violence, obesity, etc. We didn't want, I mean, diseases, yes, but... Right, we were just wondering if, if it's good to just leave a few things to, to chance. We want to give your child the best possible start. Believe me, we have enough imperfection built in already. A child doesn't need any additional burdens. And keep in mind, this child is still you. Simply the best of you. You could conceive naturally a thousand times and never get such a result. That's how my brother and... Okay. So I um, can go ahead. I can uh, minimize the um, DVD software. Um, go to, it automatically um, creates the uh, copied version of that clip in my videos. Um, and it's, as you notice, it's already right here. I've defined it to go to a Windows Media Player uh, type. I think it's MPEG-2 format, but there's also, I could do AVI to open it in QuickTime. Um, you know, whatever my preference would be. So I go ahead and open that. I just... For the sake of argument, I'm going to take the DVD out just so you don't think I'm going to snatch it. There you go. Okay. for violence, obesity, etc. We didn't want, I mean, diseases, yes, but... Uh, right, we were just wondering if, if it's good to just leave a few things to, to chance. We want to give your child the best possible start. Believe me, we have enough imperfection built in already. The child doesn't need any additional burdens. And keep in mind, this child is still you. Simply the best of you. You could conceive naturally a thousand times and never get such a result. Okay. So you see, that's the, that's the recording um, that we just made. Um, so, uh, with, with that showed, I, ho I hope you can kind of see just mm -hmm. a little bit about the DVD quality played on my computer versus um, the screen capture. I mean, there's... Uh, not a real big difference even on a, on a board. I happen to have a Promethean board, which is kind of like an educational version of a smart board in my classroom. So this is actually maybe a little bit larger, but about the size of the screen I might show to the students. Um, so with that in mind, I just wanted you to show um, just a couple things. Like I said, I won't play the, the, the long clips, but how I might use it in my classroom. Um, typically, I don't show videos on the full screen uh, because it's big enough and my classroom's substantially smaller than this room. Um, the students can obviously see um, the videos even if they are a fraction of the size of the whole screen, which actually can make the file size um, a lot smaller as well. So these are both clips that I um, obtained uh, using the same process, using their screen capture software um, on the video. Um, the one on the uh, left that I'm going to play uh, came from my libraries in the, in the high school's copy of 13 Days. And what we were doing was we were analyzing the difference of Hollywood's version of President Kennedy in 13 days versus kind of Kennedy's speech when he made it to the American public on uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so like I said, I'll just go ahead and start this. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance. Okay, like I said, some of us might be real interested in it, but nonetheless, um, I would then play Uh, then we can go through and um, play the archival footage, which I actually was able to obtain uh, from an internet site, but with the screen capture software, I was also able to make a copy of that um, and kind of embed those into, uh, this is called Active Inspire, it's the teaching software. Um, and if you were to play out the videos, you'd see that um, Hollywood actually edited and cut out parts of the actual thing that we talk about from the student's perspective, like why would they do that? And does that really change history? If Hollywood kind of plays it based on, um, or base, based on historical facts, does that actually change history? Because so many people get their views of what actually happened uh, from Hollywood movies. Uh, next one, um, just to show you really quickly, also kind of the, the quality here, I made it a little bit larger um, to show that, it, it, that there's not really a pixelization uh, effect as, as when you make uh, videos larger uh, typically happens. This happens to be, um, I also teach media literacy, um, and I showed uh, this clip uh, for um, students. It's actually from All the President's Men. 
uh, which of course dealt with the Watergate scandal. Um, and one of the things uh, in this scene is I wanted the students to pay attention to um, what was going to be on the screen in, in roughly those two uh, red circles. <laughs> Now, you may or may not be able to, to, to see it, but what's actually going on is, is you can see the uh, Robert Redford here, uh, he, he's pretty clear. Um, and behind him, the gentleman over his left shoulder um, to our right um, is actually pretty blurry. But if you look, um, and if we were to carry the scene out, the people even farther back uh, in the background who are going to kind of congregate around a, a TV monitor are actually clearer than the guy who's kind of mid-range. And, and what this is, is it's a technique using what's called dual focus lenses. So there's two focal points of the lenses, one in the back, one in the, the foreground, so that everything else is blurred. And, and we talk about, okay, well, why would a director want to do that? Why would, um, why would they want to show that? Well, if, if it wasn't clear enough, I couldn't demonstrate that because it would all be blurry anyway, or it would all be pixelized. Um, and so if you carry the scene out, like I said, um, we would go ahead and show that, that the students can actually get that. They can see, okay, well, you know, why would they want you to focus on that? Um, as opposed to just being at white noise in the background, um, and so forth. Uh, by the way, this, this film did win, I believe, the, the Academy Award for Cinematography uh, in the year that it uh, was produced. Uh, and finally, I said I won't play it, uh, but this was, if I were to play it, this was the eugenics clip that then was embedded um, into this page. Um, and then as students uh, on a Promethean board, uh, they have a, basically a pen, like a smart board, uh, which you write on your finger. We have uh, basically a pen. Uh, they could come up to the screen and they could write, you know, what, what are the pros of, of eugenics? What are, the, what are the cons of eugenics? What are the ethics of it? Uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it's, it's a far cry from, you know, the olden days when even when I was in elementary school, I remember the, you know, you have to play the whole half an hour long uh, video, and then if there was two parts of it, then the teacher had to feed it, and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what we're really trying to do is, is um, you know, take out that time that's needed, um, that, or that, this, that you don't need to see, the parts of the clips that you don't need to see, and really focus their attention on what we as a teacher really want to do. Um, and we could do that with the DVD, but it, of course it's, you know, loading it up and, and playing it, and then, you know, starting and stopping at the right clip. Uh, the advantage of doing it this way, uh, with the screen capture tech, uh, software or technique, um, is that we can we can preset that up, and then we actually have a copy of that um, on our hard drives, where I could then display it for the students, and I can embed it into the software um, and and save it for next year. Um, because if let's say I went to you know any type of internet source that that may have a clip that I need, well, what happens next year when I want to replay the same clip? <coughs> and they've either taken it down or that it's no longer there. So that, that's the advantage for me personally um, to this tech. With that, that's the end of kind of the technology piece of, of mine. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You guys are all bad students if you're not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm David Taylor. I am counsel to DVD, CCA, and AACS. And um, today I'm going to demonstrate for you the smartphone recording that I made. Um, I actually used this smartphone, um, which is my own smartphone, uh, as most people have smartphones and they're pretty ubiquitous. Um, and what I did was um, use um, a Blu-ray copy of War Horse. I didn't see it in theaters, so it was actually the reason why I chose it, because I <laughs> take advantage of it. And um, so what I'm going to do, um, as far as the demonstration, I'm going to show you the, um, the original smartphone recording. Um, go and play it twice for you so the first time you're not listening to the dialogue and you can actually focus on it the second time through. And then after that, I'm going to show you um, this um, video editing software um, and two of its features um, that are pretty straightforward and don't require uh, too much technical capability because I certainly didn't have it and um, I did it. And then finally, um, I'm going to show you the original smartphone recording versus the final product. Um, 
and uh, you'll see what those two are like. And I'm going to try to play them side by side, and hopefully, if uh, Windows Media Player and QuickTime cooperate. So here we go. So I'm not sure if everybody heard it. Um, it didn't seem to pipe through. Um, but I'm going to play it back again and try to just point out a few things as it goes through. So you have a good sense of what does a smartphone recording actually look like the first time around. And um, So I have the volume turned down here. Um, it's a pretty good picture. I mean, it's clear. I had recorded it with the subtitles on so that uh, you could see whether or not they were indeed legible. Um, that being said, it obviously suffers from the fact that it was recorded uh, with the smartphone and um, my hand is shaking. Um, there are tripods available, so if you wanted to um, um, pay $10 for a tripod uh, for a smartphone that clamps on and it would be able to hold it uh, steadier than I did. Um, and as well, um, you see that there is some graininess to it. And the graininess comes in um, at various times. Some um, scenes are, are, are very clear and then others seem to be brainier. <coughs> so um, that is basically the original smartphone recording. And 
what I'm going to show you now are two features of the um, video editing so software. This is the interface for the video editing software. And um, down here you'll see, um, it, they say it's called fine tuning and you can actually um, choose different um, filters. Um, the two filters I'm going to show you is the first one will be a stabilization. Um, and you can basically move it from off to 120%, which that's the way I recorded it. And then the second filter, of course, is above it, um, which is the clean filter. And it's, again, it's one, one click, drag it across to high, and that's how I, I did the, um, the recording. Um, the recording that I'm gonna show you is actually gonna compare the original to the enhanced version. And the original will be on, uh, on the left-hand side and the enhanced version will be on the right-hand side. And um, so here is um, that recording for the stabilization filter. suggested on the left hand side it was a bit more shakier than the right hand side. Right hand side is pretty solid right there. And if you keep track of the subtitles you can really notice um, them whether or not it's bouncing up and down. So that was uh, the stabilization feature. I'm now going to show you the, the clean filter which will um, take out some of the graininess that was in the original recording. And again, the original is um, on my right, your left. So again, um, as you look at this, um, the one on the, your right should be clearer than the one on the left. Um, and now I'm going to, um, what I should tell you is, is that my smartphone recorded the original recording in 720. Um, those two comparisons that you saw were, um, were done in 480p, and that's a limitation of the software. So just for comparison purposes, um, it was uh, reduced down. Now, when we do a comparison of the original versus the final product, the final product is will be in 720p.
So the original I'm playing in QuickTime and the um, enhanced copy I am playing in um, uh, Word Media, I mean Microsoft Windows Media. Us one more time. This one was the Reveal. What was that? It's called the Reveal 3. There's a lot of video editing software out, and this is just for the consumer market. Um, I think for uh, a little less than $50, um, it's pretty um, affordable compared to maybe something that other people use, which is uh, Microsoft Movie Maker or one of Adobe's products, which are substantially more, much more money than this. What was the phone that you're using? Um, the phone is the Droid Razor Max, and it can record in 720 and uh, um, and 1080. 
and the original was done in 720. And not the, the notice right now, but I would want to know some specs on the computer. Did you did all this on this one? Yes, I, and this is a Toshiba satellite. <laughs> and I think it probably retails for uh, about $500, so. Uh, one of the co-managers of AACS. And an IBMer for a long, long time. So long that when Tim was talking about all of the tools that they use in the classroom today, do any of you remember those projectors, those film strip projectors that we used to use? <laughs> and 16 millimeter uh, movie uh, projectors and things like that. That's what I remember in class. So um, I'm going to talk to you about um, managed copy. Managed copy is uh, one of the ways that consumers are going to have to copy uh, content uh, as the year rolls by. Uh, we intend to roll this out later this year. Uh, and then uh, Mitch Singer is going to talk to you about digital copy, which is already rolled out, and ultraviolet, which is being rolled out right now. Uh, so um, the um, sort of an overview of managed copy is um, a Blu-ray disc, and this one that we're going to use is Dark Knight, Warner Brothers release. It's got three discs in this package. The main feature, the bonus features are on a second disc, which is in the... Uh, which is in the BD-ROM drive now, and this, this also has a digital copy disk in it. So uh, this disk, this system, um, or this particular release has uh, a, lot of, a lot of content involved. We're using the second disk, uh, which has the bonus material just, just because of the length of the video. So to, um, to do a managed copy, you need the Blu-ray disk in the drive, and uh, you need some software. And the software that runs on what we call a managed copy machine at MCM is running on another Toshiba laptop. Uh, we didn't get a volume purchase or anything. <laughs> Toshiba is one of the other founders of AACS, so we, we usually, when we buy stuff, we try and buy stuff that the founders make. Uh, so um, the uh, managed copy machine is the software that actually makes the copy. The other component of the system is what we call the Managed Copy Authorization Server. And uh, that's a software that AACS had written. Uh, it's, we're going to be using the live server today, assuming the Wi-Fi in the room keeps working. Uh, it's, the software is actually uh, located on a, in a rack space facility that's, uh, I believe, located outside Chicago. So, uh, that's how the copy will get authorized. So um, I. Uh, clicked on the MCM here a couple of times and it launched a menu. Now this particular managed copy machine, we call it an emulator because it was actually written by the people that wrote the managed copy authorization server software to test their software. So there's some stuff in here that uh, a consumer's managed copy machine won't, you know, won't have that, that they needed for debugging. So when we want to do this, we just start and it's initializing and then it's going to go up to the server to request offers. So the next step is going to be talking to the server. So it's basically doing that. And uh, the stuff down at the bottom I'm talking about is, is basically the kind of stuff that uh, the, uh, the programmers needed to help them debug the, the uh, MCAS server software. So we get a list of the um, what we call the offers that are on this disk. And this is the bonus material. There's two files that are uh, 45 minutes of video called Batman Technology and Batman Unmasked. There's three trailers and then there's some TV spots. So in the interest of time, we're going to make a copy of um, just one of the TV spots because it happens pretty quickly. So there's a little bit of information on what this is. Uh, this information is part of what we call the offer. The content owners create these offers, and uh, the offers are stored on the authorization server. And when uh, 
the consumer wants to make a copy of that particular piece of video, that's the information that's loaded down to the machine that you saw when it said it was, it was uh, requesting offers. So we're going to make a copy of uh, this TV spot called Aggressive. And then <coughs> this bo bonus material here is all free. Um, actually, if we wanted to take the time to look at the main feature, it's not free. So uh, there's a payment transaction, but we're going to just see what that looks like anyway, even though this is free. So we go to this. Now again, because this was done by programmers that were testing things, they called it an accounting transaction. Uh, you would probably, it would probably say something like make my copy or something like that. So we click on that and it actually launches a browser in the, uh, out of the managed copy machine. And we, uh, for a couple of reasons, we need the, uh, the email address of the consumer. So, I'm going to key that in, and then because I'm an IBMer, I'm more used to ThinkPads, so I'm not quite so used to machines with the uh, touchpad on the, on the keyboard, so I'm not real adept at that. But uh, then one of the reasons um, why we needed the browser was to um, launch this privacy statement. So um, the uh, content owners will also have the option of adding uh, further information here on their terms and conditions if they have additional privacy information. This privacy statement just says what we're going to do with the email address that we had key in, uh, which is personally identifiable information. So we're going to accept that. And uh, if it had been a chargeable transaction, uh, in the U.S., we're going to use PayPal as our payment processor, so it would go out to PayPal, and the consumer could, e could either have a PayPal account or charge it to their credit card if it's a payable thing. So um, then it comes back with this message that says the transaction's been processed. It gives an order ID. So one of the reasons for the collecting the email uh, address was to send a, a confirmation that says this to the consumer. The second reason is, is in case the transaction blows up anywhere, uh, our customer care uh, can get back to the consumer and figure out how we want to resolve that. So uh, the payment's been processed, and now we can actually shut the browser, and we can go and ask for the copy to be made now that the payment's been received. So it's going to go, and uh, because it's just a, a TV spot, it isn't going to take very long to make the uh, to make the copy. So it's doing that now. You'll see the little blue process or progress bar flip over a couple of times. One of the one of the messages we wanted to get through to you is this is actually really simple to do, and it's going to be pretty easy for the consumer to do. So it's now making the copy. The copy is being made off of the Blu-ray disc that's in the it's in the ROM drive in this machine. So the speed of making the copy is determined by the speed of the optical disk drive. As optical disk drives get faster, the copy can be faster. So it's done making the copy now, and um, if you want to see it, we can go up to a player and kick off a player and go down, I think we called it, I think we did the yeah. aggressive one, right? And it's labeled 511. So the, the uh, file is the long file on here, and it's just going to start playing. So with that, uh, a consumer can make a copy from their Blu-ray disc to, um, we support uh, different types of protected outputs. So will, the consumer will be able to choose from an output to hard disk, which is what this is, uh, or um, they'll be able to choose uh, within uh, the Microsoft DRM Play Ready system. I'm going to make a copy to that. They'll be able to make a copy to physical media, such as a, a writable um, DVD or an SD card or a Sony uh, memory stick. So they'll be able to make copies to different types of media. So hopefully, um, I got my point across that this is a pretty simple deal. Now, we anticipate a couple questions. When's it going to be ready? Uh, we anticipate launching this in the U.S. in the fall, uh, 
the server we use, the server is, is actually ready to go. We use the real server today. Uh, what we found out as we were doing some education sessions with the content owners is uh, we needed to come up with some tools to help them uh, figure out what information is actually on the optical disk. The requirement for content owners on managed copy in the AACS license is to, to allow consumers to make managed copies of every disk that was released since December, December 4th, 2009. So there have been actually thousands of disks released since then, and they needed some automated tools to pull this information off the disk, and it was the stuff that you actually saw in the upper right-hand corner of the machine, the descriptive information of a particular file we were making the copy of. And uh, so uh, that's going to delay. We'd actually planned to launch by now, right about the end of May. And uh, that's going to delay the launch a, little, a few months so that we can get these tools done and get them in the hands of the content owners to build their, their offers. But, you know, this thing is going to happen in the fall. Uh, and some of the companies that are going to make managed copy machines are very interested in being able to do that as part of the holiday season. It's, uh, it's happening. Um, another question we anticipate you might have is, can this be used for clips? And technically, it can. Um, we didn't really, when we designed it, we didn't really plan on that. We were planning on for consumers making copies. But the technology can be adapted to that. Uh, we talked to our software supplier about that. We know it can be done. So if that's something that needs to be done, we could, we could probably do that. So, any questions on managed copy? So I gather from the last thing you said, when you make a copy, at this point the only option is to make a copy of the entire thing, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Right. And it's a protected copy, so you it's can't just start pulling copy. that off and putting it in other things. Right. But if you put it on portable media, you can take it to other devices that support that copy protection system. Right. But for, for, for those folks who are arguing that, for example, I should be able to take a clip and put it into something else, some other work. That's not something this would really permit. Not the way it is right now, correct. Yeah, and we understand the, you know, the, uh, the requirement. So if, if the other stuff you're seeing here, and you're going to see, Mitch is going to show you some mm -hmm. other things too. Uh, if the other stuff isn't enough, this is something we could easily look at. And it's a perfect copy, in other words, exactly the same quality? It, the, there are different uh, resolutions for different output technologies. So, for instance, if you want to burn a copy to a writable DVD, that doesn't support high definition, that standard definition, so it would be downloaded. But what we did here was a full resolution copy. Mm -hmm. It's an output technology we call the bound copy method, and that supports full resolution. Okay? Short and sweet. Excellent. So my name is Mitch Singer. I am uh, with Sony Pictures. I'm also the president of uh, the consortium that launched Ultraviolet. I'm, I'm really here to talk about uh, Ultraviolet, but I think the best way to get to Ultraviolet is to talk about where we've been and uh, kind of the, the pathway through. So the first thing that's been on everybody's mind and has been happening to the media industry for a while now is notions of disruption. And um, it's not anything new. Disruption has been happening for centuries. It's been happening to the media industry for probably about the last decade or so. And uh, Clayton Christensen, who teaches uh, disruption at Harvard Business School, um, has a series of books on innovators' dilemma and how difficult it is to actually innovate within existing organizations. But the one takeaway from, from Clayton is that if you don't innovate, um, if you don't find opportunities in the disruption, you perish. And uh, we've seen what happened to the music industry. While there are many artists still in the music industry, the actual industry itself has lost probably half of the employees due to uh, revenue loss. And so it was very important when I think about our industry, the motion picture industry, that we, we keep disruption at the very, very top of our conscience to make sure that we don't view disruption as a threat and try to stop it. We look at disruption as, as opportunities. And it's very important as I go through the journey from DVD to Blu-ray managed copy to bonus digital copy to ultraviolet, you see that um, looking for opportunities in the disruption is one of the one of the key key themes throughout this. 
So the bottom line on DVD is that it was uh, launched in, in 97 in March. It's protected, obviously, with CSS. And um, even though it's a play-only model, uh, it was the most successful format launch in the history uh, of the industry, in the history of the me in, in media. And um, it was the first time we've kind of put our movies on shiny little discs, random access, added value, uh, consumers perceived value, and, and as a re result, it took off. But there was a lot we learned uh, from DVD. Um, we learned one thing when Jan Johansson uh, hacked CSS in 1999. Uh, we learned how consumers started using the hack. And, uh, and I think that's really where PK may have got it a little bit wrong here in their filing. It wasn't really about trying to space shift you know, DVDs on other screens in the house. Uh, if I wanted to watch a DVD at the time on my laptop or my computer, they all had DVD drives, and, and so that was not a problem. And of course, if I wanted to watch it on my TV, I had DVD players. What it really was about is looking for opportunities in the disruption. If there's anything that, that also that you, you learn from disruption is that disruption allows ordinary people to do what previously only highly skilled people can do. So if I see highly skilled people using a circumvention tool, the question for me you know, as, as a studio exec is, how do we build that functionality into the next product to give consumers the ability to legitimately make a backup copy of content they own, as opposed to you know, getting a Netflix account and just subscribing to DVDs and ripping them to my hard drive? And as, and as a result, when we started thinking about launching Blu-ray, and this goes back to 2002, 2003, uh, Don just showed you a uh, managed copy. We are actually building that functionality into the next format to say, we hear you, we understand how the technology is being used, let's build the functionality into the product itself so consumers now can make backup copies of content that they acquire. But it became evident that over time consumers wanted more. So about 2008, 2009, we started seeing services roll out. We started seeing iTunes and Xbox and PlayStation and now Amazon and a lot of other online services that were delivering content. So the next, the next journey actually took us to bonus digital copy. And so bonus digital copy allowed a consumer um, to actually buy something on a disc, like, a, like this one has digital copy, and then actually take a copy of this and put it into the platform of their choice. For example, Warrior, actually comes with a code for iTunes. So what this allows me to do, it allows me to go to the iTunes store, put in the code, and then this movie now is playable from iTunes as though I purchased it from iTunes and playable on all my Apple devices. That's the concept between bonus, digi of, of bonus digital copy. And of course, if you look at something like here, Wolverine, Wolverine is a bonus digital copy, but it actually comes with a, the movie on the disc. So now you can actually take the movie from the disc and load it onto your laptop or load it onto your Mac if you wanted to put it on your Mac. So again, bonus digital copy allowed consumers to actually get the advantage of buying a disc and without using circumvention tools, get to play it on the device or the platform that they, that they, choose, that they chose. But it turned out that consumers still wanted a little bit more. And th the key point here was, if I took a copy and I put it into, and I wanted to play it on my iPhone or iPad, for example, um, I couldn't play it anywhere else. If I put it onto my PC, I'd, I'd be locked to the PC. If I wanted to put it into my Amazon locker, I could only view it from Amazon, a series of proprietary uh, silos. So when we polled consumers and we asked them, what is it about digital content that you actually want, consumers basically told us a few things. They told us they wanted to share content with their family. That was, that was a, a, a key attribute. Um, if you download a movie on your iPad, for example, and you wanted to uh, let someone in your family watch the movie, you'd have to give them the, your, your iPad. Um, they were worried that, what happens if I downloaded a movie and my hard drive crashed? Right, 2008, 2009, there's nothing, there, there were no cloud services. You downloaded the movie onto your platform and it was yours to do with what you wanted. So consumers were worried about that. There was, um, Another concern, consumer's voice, that what happens if I'm watching it on, um, for example, an Apple platform, 
and some family member comes in my house with a new you know, Verizon Android phone, I can't play the copy on that platform. So once the consumers make a technology decision and they're locked to a plat platform, very difficult now to take that content and play it on the platform of their choice. And of course, keeping track of what you own. So I bought movies on Xbox, I bought movies from PlayStation, I have movies from iTunes. When I want to play that movie, I have to remember where I bought it from, on what platform. I might look for a movie and it's not on iTunes, so I'll head over to PlayStation, I'll look at PlayStations, the movie's not there. No place you can aggregate everything you bought, like my physical bookshelf in my home, where it doesn't matter what I bought, it was all sitting on my bookshelf. So we launched Ultraviolet in October. It's the first interoperable cloud service, and that's really what I'm here to demo. Right now, it's bundled with Blu-ray and DVD. So for example, um, I might buy this DVD of incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly loud, incredibly close, and in it comes a coupon for Ultraviolet. It has a code on it. That code entitles me to get a token. Basically, what Ultraviolet is very much like, it's almost like an ATM platform. It's an authentication service. It puts a digital proof of purchase into my personal locker. Um, we use multiple DRMs. So we encrypt the file in such a way that it can be decrypted by up to five DRMs today. So device manufacturers design freedom. They can use the DRM of their choice. And consumers now can move the content, will be able to move the content. We'll be launching what's called the common file format very shortly from one device in their home to another. The usage model is download, it's streaming, and it's share, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, any device, anytime, I think we're covered on over three to 400 million devices today, and we just launched six months ago, and it supports disk to digital. Uh, I'll show you what that is. Uh, the consortium itself has a lot of different companies in the consortium. I know you probably can't read this, uh, but most of the major companies are in here. We're, we're, in the last week, we've added two more companies. I think we're up to 78 or 79 now. I, I can't keep track. But they're companies that are, you know, internet back-end service companies, and they're, you know, Microsoft and Comcast and, you know, Nokia and CE companies and motion picture studios are all part of the consortium to actually deliver this product to consumers. From a consumer standpoint, it should be relatively easy. You look for the logo. It's ultraviolet. It's on content that you either buy physically or you buy digitally. And when you buy it, it goes into your ultraviolet locker. You sign up for ultraviolet. It's this cloud service is absolutely free, and you start collecting movies. As your movies grow, you may want to watch them. You watch them on whatever device you want, anytime, anywhere. You have an opportunity from some retailers to actually burn physical media. If you want to buy it electronically and burn a disc, you can. And I will show you what that looks like. So let me get out of the PowerPoint presentation. And head over. So this is, this is my account, it's the Mitchflix account. And uh, I can go to my library. So this is, this is the cloud service that keeps track of everything I, I own. And third party services like Flixster and Voodoo, which I'll show you, go up to my ultraviolet account, they see what I have rights to, and then they present them to me so I can view them across any platform. So here, for example, is my library. Some of these li some of these discs, I actually, um, I have about 40 movies now in my Ultraviolet account. Uh, half of them I actually got from uh, Disc to Digital, and I don't have the link. Let me see if I can very quickly find the link and let, let Walmart and Voodoo explain to you, you what Disc to Digital is.
in the Bird family, they love movies. Now, are you wondering why I asked you to bring your DVDs to Walmart? Yeah. yeah. Let me show you something that caught. Walmart can now convert your DVDs from disc to digital. So now you'll never break them, scratch them, or lose them. Isn't that cool? Yes! Sweet! The good thing is you can watch them on your laptop, tablet, phone, anytime, anywhere. And you get them all for two bucks a piece. They're yours for Earth. Awesome. That's a Walmart Entertainment Vista the Digital Service. Bring your favorite DVDs to your local Walmart photo center to get started. So what, what Walmart is actually doing is it's providing a service that you can bring your legacy media into Walmart and to the extent that Voodoo has it in the Voodoo library, Voodoo has about 5,000 movies available today, uh, they just put a token in your ultraviolet account and then you can access, access those movies directly from Voodoo. So half of the movies I have are actually from uh, Voodoo. The, the, other, the other thing uh, about ultraviolet that I want to show before I go to the Voodoo part is the fact that you can share uh, with your family. So my, my account has uh, six family members in the account. My, uh, it's me and my girlfriend, my son who's going to Berkeley, uh, my daughter who lives with her mom in Houston, uh, my brother who lives about 20 miles from me. The good news is he doesn't come over and steal my Blu-rays anymore. Uh, and my sister, um, Karen, uh, who I just added to my account last week, and she lives in uh, the south of France. So this is my family, and every single time I add a movie, they can access it, and stream it wherever they happen to be. In this case, my daughter is 14, she has parental control, so she doesn't see 40 movies in the account. She only sees those movies that are PG-13 and below, so she has a filtered view of the account. But when I add a movie, she's in Houston with her mom, she goes on to Flickster, she uses an Amazon Kindle, and she just streams the movie uh, right to Houston. Uh, my sister, same thing, she can stream anywhere in the world. The idea behind Ultraviolet was, they're my movies, I get to share them with my family, and when I travel, I take the movies along with me. So that's kind of the, the, the family of it all. The, um, the other part is, um, I said you can download. So this is the Voodoo player. So Voodoo has a download app that you can download um, onto your PC or Mac. So I've downloaded a, a bunch of movies here. And so this allows me, if I'm on a plane, I'm disconnected from the internet, I can still watch a movie. So these are loaded on my hard drive because Voodoo allows me to load it on my hard drive. And uh, you can go anywhere I need to be So this allows the disconnected experience uh, through the Voodoo app. Again, PCs and, and Macs. And what is that? Okay. Holy smokes. So another part of the demo is that even though Apple is not one of the members uh, in the consortium, um, that was a Voodoo app. The good, the, um, there's also an app called Flickster. So the, the, again, the idea behind Ultraviolet is any service that comes online, even if it's now or if it's two years from now, uh, if I give them permission to access my account, they can go up to the Ultraviolet account, they can get the movies and present them to me. So here's, here's Flickster, for example. And uh, I have a bunch of movies here, again, pulled from my Ultraviolet account. I get to my collection. And so uh, Flickster uses bookmarks. So let's say uh, it's the bottom of the ninth inning and Oakland's going for their 20th game and you want to see Hatterberg, you know, hit the home run uh, that won it. I can just hit, and if the broadband is working here, this should just start right where I left off. So if I want a particular clip, I can start watching a clip in this particular case. This is my favorite scene, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so this could be my, my daughter, for example, in Houston watching it. Same thing, another iPad. I can get the Flickster app, start streaming a different movie on, on this one here if you want to just grab it. And if you tap it, there's a done button that you can go back and scroll through other movies. Same thing here, so here's the Flickster app. Um, you can hit download, so I can also download onto the iOS. So again, if I'm disconnected, I can also watch the movie if, uh, if I um, have a disconnected experience. And I won't do friends with that because that's probably not appropriate. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Dolphin Tail, if I wanted to do that. Did he hit it yet? Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> and again, so this starts at the beginning where I left off. So again, this is. 
this is actually going back to the Flixster service. It's authenticating who I am because I use a, a username and sign on, and then it goes ahead and streams me the movie. And so here's, I I also have Voodoo running on the iPad, but we're but somehow the Copyright Office doesn't like Voodoo, so they <laughs> cut off access to Voodoo, but not Flixster. But don't cut off Flixster, so I might be because I might be back. Um, this is this is a Barnes and Noble uh, Nook. So there's another, just a Nook device. It doesn't have Voodoo running on it, but it happens to have Flickster on it. And let me see if I can, oh, I have to. Let me just see. No, not that. So the cool thing about, of course, parental controls here is that if you have kids in your family, they only get access to the things that you want, you actually want them to see. So again, another platform, I can watch it on, I can watch it on my Nook if I want. Again, Flickster app go into the server, authenticating who I am, and then providing me the content that I own. And you can anticipate seeing what happens is, and the cool thing about this in a way is, it may, may very well be that my daughter, for example, loves Voodoo. She can watch all her movies from Voodoo. I happen to like Flickster. I can watch them all from, from Flickster. In the future, I may buy a phone that, where, the, where the service is AT&T, and AT&T now will just be able to connect and provide me movies on the AT&T phone on whatever service AT&T provides. And if Barnes & Noble launches a service, I'll be able to watch it directly from the Barnes & Noble service. So this is, again, the, the, the idea behind Ultraviolet was to, to really um, look at the technology that's available in the market and put it all together in a way that creates that right balance between enabling consumers to get access to movies that they collect and at the same time having the appropriate protections in place so that content providers feel comfortable in putting content into the ecosystem. So I think I covered everything on the demo. Any questions on ultraviolet? Any questions on access? Anything? You guys are bad students. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, we all set? Good afternoon, my name is Jim Morissette, and I'm the technical director of Car Templin Films in Chicago documentary films that are shown on public television, on cable networks, and in movie theaters. And I'm here today to address two issues. One issue is the changing landscape of our requirements in terms of providing finished programs. And then to assess and describe how the alternatives to, um, to our, um, our protected video exemption um, don't work for us anymore. Um, we recently finished two major shows in the last year and a half, um, a Frontline Show on PBS and an American Master Show. And both shows made extensive use of archival clips off of DVD, and the, exempt, the current exemption served us very well. But the landscape is changing in terms of what primarily public television now requires. They require only high-def programs, 1080 by 1920. So basically, what started out on DVD as acceptable in the standard definition resolution, which you can see in red, with 345,000 pixels per frame, now we're suddenly required to deliver content in the HD, or blue size, at over six times the pixel count, over two million pixels per frame. So where do we get those pixels? Um, and that's the question. And PBS is very stringent in terms of what they will allow us to use in terms of content that is not high definition. And they're constantly updating their technical operating specifications, uh, which look like they were typed on a typewriter from about 25 years ago. But they do include some very specific um, details according to not only just resolution, but field order and all sorts of other minutiae of detail that I have to make sure passes the muster, otherwise our shows don't get on television. Even the audio specifications range from objectionable to not objectionable, with many different places in the middle. So what are our alternatives right now? Well, what we've been doing is we've been up-converting standard definition material to high definition, which basically means 
adding more information to the image, six times as much information. And you can do that in software, and it looks terrible. You can do it in relatively inexpensive hardware. It looks terrible and is also unacceptable. And the only way we can use now DVDs with standard definition in our high definition program is to up resolution them using very complicated and expensive hardware. Um, a DVD with CSS on it, um, we have to take out the analog signal off the DVD player because as we all know the HDMI high def signal, up converted high def signal off the DVD player is not accessible for file generation. We go into a Terranex up converter which handles all of the problems for the most part technical problems having to do with field order and signal to noise ratio and all the processing things that are necessary to do. And then it outputs a high definition signal which we have to record somehow. So we need the ability to record in real time a full blown high definition signal, convert that into a file that we can edit. Terranex box is, as you can see, relatively complex um, to operate. Uh, it's around $2,000, the price just came down. Um, the least expensive hardware box for capturing high definition in real time uh, via Matrox HD capture box, which you then, of course, hook to your uh, Mac or PC uh, editing system. Um, so that's an expensive alternative that just barely passes the mustard because what the Terranex does is it interpolates the video signal. It makes up what it thinks is the rest of the picture. So 80% of the picture is made up with fake information. It tries to guess, well, here's a pixel here and one here, so let's figure out something in the middle. And, you know, you get a, a result that is not as good, certainly, as starting with a high definition signal. So that alternative, while expensive, is what, we've, what we're currently doing. Um, there's been some other techniques suggested um, that we try and see if we can get a broadcast quality PBS specification signal out of you know, either a standard def DVD or, in this case, I'm going to show you a high def Blu-ray. So, we tried something called scan conversion, which is basically the old kinescope method from the 50s. You take a camera, a movie camera or a video camera, you aim it at a TV set, and you saw the demonstration earlier. Um, when we tried it, we took the latest iPhone 4S, which does shoot 1080 high definition, and since we have to deliver in high def at 1080, that's what we were shooting at, we had to kind of rig up some kind of a little clamp stand device because there's there are no tripod connections on, on iPhones. Um, there are also no audio inputs on most cell phone cameras. You're stuck with the microphone that's in the camera, which means that you're recording the speakers coming off the TV set, bouncing around the room, and if anybody sneezes, it's in your audio track. So here is an example of the iPhone shooting some of our own material. And you can note that as the scene shifts from bright to dark, the exposure shifts because all these phones are auto exposure. And when you have rapid cuts and lots of exposure change, which we always do in documentary, it's an unacceptable flashing and blooming. The other thing that we found with cell phones is that they, not only the audio auto exposure problem, but there's something called moray, which is a kind of a screen door effect that happens when you have very fine, tiny pixels in a camera interacting with very fine pixels on your display. In the old days, in standard definition, you're using much lower pixel count. Pixels were bigger, you didn't have as much of this problem. But up, now that we're up at, you know, two million pixels, both on the display and on the camera, you get this, this interaction. Um, just by way of comparison, this is the iPhone shooting a high definition broadcast quality monitor. Here is the, the next slide is the same frame taken from a standard def DVD. 
it exhibits none of the issues of excessive contrast or more rent because it's a file right from the disk. Um, so we didn't like that. So we moved on and we thought we'd experiment with screen capture software, which you also saw a nice demonstration of. It basically is using the computer to record its own playback. And the problem here is we tried it on a 3.1 gigahertz i7 processor quad-core Macintosh. Pretty beefy machine. Eight gigs of RAM. And we played um, a high-def file and tried to capture it at 30 frames a second, which is what we have to produce our programs in. Technically, it's 29.97, but we'll say 30 just to keep it simple. Um, and this is what we got. Oops, sorry. Um, before I show you the clip, I just want to make a comment about the replay uh, capture software, which we looked into. And I was amazed that in their user guide, they say for smooth video, smooth, moving video images, use 20 frames per second or less as your capture frame rate. Well, that doesn't do us any good. That means we're throwing away 30% of the frames in our original source, never to be retrieved. And you can see that problem in the jerkiness of the video that we captured off the screen. Now, we're capturing this at high definition. So it's a 1080 by 1920 image on the computer. And it just can't keep up. Now, in standard def, it seems to work a lot better because, again, you've got one-sixth the pixels. You've got 300,000 versus 2 million. And the other problem with screen capture software that we discovered, much to our dismay, is that Apple has quietly decided to make its current version of the operating system, Lion, which you get on any Mac that you would buy today, it doesn't allow any screen capture software if you're playing a DVD or any file from iTunes. Here's a, our movie playing off a DVD in, on the computer. It looks great. As soon as we launch screen capture software, this is what we get. A checkerboard mess. And that's what gets recorded, the checkerboard. So this may or may not be a problem on the PC, but on the Macintosh, it means that we can't capture anything that's playing back in the Macintosh, in the built-in Macintosh DVD player or anything from iTunes, whether it's rented, streamed, or whatever. Now, there is a method of recording the screen that involves hardware. And any time you involve hardware, you can expect much better performance than just simply software. Because if you think about it, a computer has to play a Blu-ray disc and display it on a 1080 by 1920 screen, and then at the same time record all that 30 frames a second. It's a lot of overhead on the computer. So why not offload the recording part to hardware? Well, the problem is it's a burdensome technology, and it's expensive. Um, hardware boxes of this sort, um, actually, there's the hardware box for pulling it off the, um, off the screen. These are the kind of boxes that are used by TV stations when they put YouTube videos or screen capture stuff, live stuff from you know, uh, online on the air. This is the only way that they can get quality that's uh, acceptable without drop frames. Now, another suggestion was that we try to, because a lot, a lot of what we do are documentaries that explore present-day social issues and what caused them. So we have a lot of archival footage in our programs. And we do get footage from the National Archives here. And it was suggested that, oh, if you need that in blue, in high definition, maybe the original film could be rescanned. Well, we would love that. It would look gorgeous. However, it's an extremely expensive and time-consuming thing to have to do. You have to have an archivist pull out the original film rolls, take them into a film transfer suite, and you can't just put these 50-year-old 35-millimeter newsreels on a projector. 
you have to scan in every frame one by one into this huge list of individual files. Um, the scanner that we use when we occasionally come across some old footage that nobody has, that's been sitting in somebody's basement, is we take it and we have it done in Chicago on an Airy film scanner that captures it at about two frames a second because it has to move it, take its picture, move it, and then we have to pay to have it strung together and create a video high def file that has to then be recorded and then given to us. And the last one that we did, I think it was 16 millimeter. Um, it was a 400 foot roll, which is about 11 minutes. Cost us $800. And since it's archival, you can't just go in and say, oh, let's just, just queue up this part of it. When you're an archivist and you're transferring delicate old footage, you start at the beginning and you go to the end. You don't stop, you don't go in there and fast forward. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a look into analog again. It's like we, before the exemption, when we needed material from DVDs, we used the analog outputs of the DVD players, um, which wasn't real simple to do well, but it sort of worked back in those days. But we needed a time-based corrector to stabilize the signal, and more importantly, to take off the analog copy protection known as macrovision. Um, and we had to then capture the file. We had to digitize that analog signal and then create editable files from that. And at every level, there are issues. Um, the specifications of standard definition analog signal are totally significantly different than they are for a standard def digital signal, much less a high def signal. Things like black levels and um, all this kind of stuff that had to be dealt with. Here's a, a shot of some of the legacy analog equipment that we have at our office, because we're constantly getting VHS tapes and all sorts of old analog material from historic uh, purposes. Um, and, you know, time-based correctors were all the rage, you know, 20 years ago. And now you can't even buy them. They're built into video decks. Nobody even has video decks anymore. Tape is, is long gone. We keep a whole bunch of them around with every format, one from every format that's existed since videotape started. And you'd be surprised how often we have to use them. And then there's Final Cut 10. This is the latest version of Apple's high-end professional video editing software. And I would say about two-thirds of the independent documentary uh, film companies in the country use Final Cut because it's less expensive, it's an open architecture, you can hook up your own video boxes to it. Um, and when they went to version 10 or version X, they did one good thing, they went up to a 64-bit, which means that everything works much faster, but they decided to kill analog. So Final Cut Pro 10. You can import any kind of file you want and it'll deal with it. It will not handle any tape or analog signal source inputs. So if we have a DVD or even a Blu-ray that we want to pull the analog signals off of, you can't do them with Final Cut Pro anymore. So in summary, we've got these sort of sources that we've relied upon and that we're relying upon. Uh, first one, DVDs, well, you know, they're not high def. And converting them to high def is, you know, expensive, burdensome, and the results are marginal. So we don't go there. Also, the analog uh, component outputs of DVD players are gone. The only thing that's outputting from a standard def DVD player now is HDMI which is, again, a fake up conversion with hardware copy protection, so you can't plug that HDMI into anything that will record the signal into something that we can use. Blu-ray, gorgeous. We love it. But currently, we have no way of getting high def out of the Blu-ray. Why is that? Well, because the HD or the analog outputs now are all standard def, and that was mandated on a hardware level. 
And some of the Blu-ray players, some of the lower cost ones, don't even have analog out at all. Or if they do, it's composite, it's standard def, terrible video that's no better than a DVD player. Now, let's say you want to record television shows or newscasts. We do a lot of recording of newscasts. We're currently working on a documentary about Janesville, Wisconsin, and the whole activity, political activity that's going on there is affecting a number of our characters. And so we need to record, you know, CNN and other news reports so that we have them to, to use. Um, the problem is, they now have something called selectable output control. What we've been doing is taking the component analog signals and recording them right into our edit system. In high def, look gorgeous. Well, now they have these down res tokens that they turn on so that the analog outputs are only standard depth. And the analog outputs are going to, you know, disappear soon anyway. So the analog window is rapidly closing. The other source that we have need to access is streaming video. And streaming video, there is no analog version, never has been. How do you record something off the web? Well, if you can't get the file, or if the file is encrypted, then you're left with what? Screen capture software, I guess. Which again, is gonna give us the same problems of stuttering uh, that we had in precise identification of the frame. All that kind of stuff is going to be, and is still a problem. So, What's the solution? Well, it's very simple. What we need to do is preserve our existing exemption so that we can access uh, the DVDs because there there's a lot of material that only exists on standard dev, right? The, the back catalog, as they say in the ebook language. Um, but, you know, adjust it a little bit for these digital changes in our ecosystem. The digital changes being our need for high def footage and access to those sources, which currently are Blu ray and encrypted video. For example, an iTunes download. If we want to show a uh, current TV show and how the characters in there are making fun of, you know, minority characters that are in our documentaries, it would be great if we could just, you know, Pay for the movie on iTunes, download it, and then use it. And again, when I say use it, I mean we only use a tiny little piece. When we uh, extract um, a clip from a DVD, we don't rip the whole DVD. It's crazy. We use a program called uh, Handbrake that lets us pick a particular chapter. We rip, you know, rip that chapter, bring it into the edit system, that's it. There's never a copy of the movie sitting around on the hard drive anywhere. We don't have the disk space or the time, and we are content producers. So we fully understand the issues of possible piracy or a laptop falling into the wrong hands. So we, we take precautions. Um, any questions? Yes, talk to you. I'd like you to tell me more about the hardware scan. You um, mm -hmm. used in a previous slide, and you said that uh, television studios use that. Tell me more about why yeah. this is not acceptable for you. Um, what they use it for primarily are standard definition YouTube type videos, where they need to take a web page and isolate a part of it and convert that into a signal that they can broadcast. Um, for us, what we would need is a whole separate <coughs> computer setup, um, as well as the boxes, and then as well as something to record the output of the boxes. So they, they run this stuff live or they dump it into their server or whatever. And documentary filmmakers, you know, they can't really be a CNN studio. You know, we can't afford to buy all this equipment and train and hire people to run it constantly just for that few moments we, you know, once a week or whatever that we need to pull a clip from somewhere. We can 
And you can't really call it out either. It's not something that is, we've tried. We've, there is a service in Chicago that records every news network in you know, 24 hours a day, and you call up and you say, you know, at 6 o'clock news, about 10 minutes in, they had a story about such and such. And for a fee, they will send you, guess what, a DVD that was recorded analog on one of those, you know, instant DVD recorders, DVD-R recorder. And half the time, it's not even in the right aspect ratio. It's letterbox instead of being a full widescreen image. And none of them are doing this with high def. And we need high def. And it's out there. It's just so frustrating that we can't access it. Anybody else? Thank you for your attention.